I'm going along and all of a sudden, you know, there's just running tracks everywhere and I'm sitting there, I've got my head down, I'm trying to make sense of it. And in the back of my head, I can hear my dad saying, get your head out of your ass, you're there, you know? And so I pick my head up and start still hunting and all of a sudden here comes a, a doe running back down over what the shelf kind of quartering towards me. And I'm like, oh, that's a doe and I, I hear it grunt. Welcome to another episode of Northwoods Whitetails. I'm your host, Travis Williams. I'm sitting down tonight with Mark Head. Hello. And his, oh. hello, hello, Mark. Hello. Mark. hello, how's it going? And his buddy, Tim Nolan. Hi there. Tim, how are you? I'm great. Thanks Thank for making the trip over. You yep. live in Ossipee? Yep. So yep. tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, um, how you and Mark kind of got to know each other. And All right. Well, um, I grew up on a working farm in Moultonboro. Uh, it's been in my family for about a hundred years now. Um, you know, growing up, it was still really active. We did beef cows. We did sugar and a lot of hay, big gardens, Christmas trees, logging, firewood with my grandfather. And, uh, you know, it was the best possible childhood, really. I mean, it, it, at least from my perspective, it can't get any better. Um, we still have the property. It's in the family. You know, my mother and her siblings own it. We don't farm anything anymore. Um, the fields are still getting cut for hay. And then I mow the pastures. We gave up sugar in here. What? 12, 15, 10 years ago, maybe it just got to be too much trying to do that and about 3000 taps. So a pretty good size commitment, but trying to do that outside of a full-time job was just too much. Yeah. But uh, grew up there, uh, went to college uh, up in Maine, Unity, sm real small school in Waldo County, went there for forestry, moved back here in the, in what, 90, no, 98, and uh, have lived in Ospie ever since. Uh, work as a forester, um, started working for the company when it was in Shikoroa Forest Land Improvement. And in 2020, the last of the people that started it retired, and I took over ownership. Um, you know, manage Timberland, act as a landowner's agent, forester. We have about 50,000 acres we manage in Maine and New Hampshire. And, you know, that's about it. I met Mark. When did you start working for us? 2000. 2000. Yeah, and through, then you got done, what, 2018, 19? 19. So, knew him for quite a while, taught Mark how to log. Yeah, there's some stories there that <laughs> probably shouldn't get told. Well, it's funny, Mark taught me how to log. Uh, I guess. <laughs> or, or should I say, taught me how to cut down a tree. Yeah. Showed you the correct way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, no, Mark worked, he came, he was fresh out of high school, he was just... You weren't even 21 yet when you come to work for us. I think I just turned 21, maybe. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he, he and I hit it right off. You know, we started hunting and fishing together pretty pretty, pretty regular, regular right off the bat. And, uh, yeah, here we are 25 years later. Right. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard a lot of, obviously you and I have chatted some, Tim, but I've heard a lot of stories where me and Tim and Tim and I and then. Tim and I did this, and Tim and I did that. So it's pretty cool. So you guys both are in logging. And a question I always like to ask people, I and mean, we had um, Mark and John on recently, is, yep. you know, do you feel like working in the woods is, is kind of like an advantage when it comes to your hunting? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm in the woods, you know, most days, all day. Uh, and just being in the woods and being used to looking in the woods for me helps, you know, because I mean, if you're interested in hunting, if it's all you think about, like it is for us there, even when I'm in there, I may be, you know, like today I'm painting wood to be cut. You know, I'm constantly looking at deer sign and thinking like, oh, you know, there's, look at how they're running on this shelf or look at this old rub from last year up on top of the hill. And you're always thinking about it. And for me, I think just, I never get out of the out of the habit of it. I'm in the woods, so I'm constantly looking and thinking. And the other good thing is I trudge around in the woods for a living, so even as big as I am, I stay in hunting shape. 
Um, I mean, look at me. I'm built for trudging and dragging. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. He's the guy you want to call for the listeners that can't see him. Um, you want to call Tim when you drag a buck out of the woods. Well, we always had a joke going if we ever got hurt out in the woods, I was going to have to field dress Tim to get him out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. My dad used to say that about my grandfather. <laughs> um, yeah. So you obviously grew up in a family where hunting was quite the heritage. Oh, yeah. My grandfather was, he was hell on deer. Um, and him and my dad, they're all dead, so we can say this. But, I mean, that man, we had a lot of beef cows. And, you know, my mother grew up on the farm, and they didn't eat much beef, but they ate a lot of red meat. Um, and, you know, all through the, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, right up into the 80s, you know, he, he hunted a lot. And, you know, everyone in his family got a deer every year. Um, he had a camp up right up against the National Forest. Him and a few other guys bought it in the late 50s, early 60s. It was just, it was an old like a wagon or something that they, you know, parked in one spot and turned into a camp. But uh, it was the only time, you know, he hunted around home here, but he didn't uh, he didn't like it as much because, you know, it's hunting on the farm. And it's a big farm. At the time, it was still about 800 acres. But, you know, he always said, you know, it's one thing to shoot deer down here, but it's not relaxing. It's not hunting because everywhere he looks, he's saying, oh, geez, that fence needs to be mended or this, that, or the other. So he'd go up to camp, uh, and they'd hunt up in the National Forest, him, my dad, and a group of guys. And, uh, you know, when I first started hunting in the 80s, uh, they still had the camp. And uh, so I started hunting up there in the late 80s, and, you know, it's country that I still hunt in. You know, that's what, 30 years or more. 40 years? Yeah, I don't know. Time flies. It's been a long time. But, you know, there's country that I can remember being up there. And, you know, even before I was, uh, you know, carrying a gun myself, being up in there, you know, with them when they shot deer and that. And then, you know, they knew that country so well because in, you know, how it is in the National Forest, there's not a lot of deer, but you figure out where the deer travel through the big woods. And it's funny that even this long down the line, the deer still travel in the same spots. You know where to go to pick up a track. You know where to go. Or if you move some deer, if you got two or three guys hunting up in there, you can say, well, you run all the way up this ridge back three or four saddles, and I'm going to swing down here and swing up around this side of the mountain and if i bump something odds are it's going to go through that saddle way up in there and you know it's just it's funny how they don't change much how they travel in in a piece of woods well it, i think it goes to if you spend the time in the woods and you you start learning how deer travel they're all they're always going to travel the same shelves the same yeah same routes you know the path less least resistance and for sure. That's never going to change. It's always going to be the same. You know, and I can just imagine listening to you talk, like, because you spend so much time in the woods, like, I feel like I spend a lot of time in the woods. But it's a fraction of the time that you spend in the woods. And I can tell you for myself, I can be antler hunting, hiking, just going for a walk in the woods, scouting or hunting, and come up on that shelf or that pinch point or that whatever and go, it's going to be a scrape right here. You know it. When you see it, you're there, just like, this is a spot that they move. This right, is where they travel. And to you, it's got to be to that 10th degree because you're spending that much more time. You're that more in tune with your environment. It's like people used to say to me all the time when I was a guide, I used to say, listen, because I'm a fishing guide doesn't mean I have like superhuman powers because people felt like, oh, you're a guide. You must know something that I don't. But what I did have was time on the water day in and day out i just knew when the fish were gonna bite where and on what and that was just time yep so i think that's what i've heard a commonality amongst loggers woodsmen in general people that work in the woods is that time that you spend in that environment you just pick up little things that, and there's probably things you pick up that you don't even know you're picking up mm -hmm. you're constantly in tune with it because you're just there every day it's not something you're thinking about you know consciously but you're just you're always looking yeah, it just becomes instinctual at that point. It's like yeah. muscle memory. 
you're almost becoming part of nature again. Have you ever been like worked on a job or done a, like, you do anything for national forest at all or is it all local? No, it's, um, it's private landowners. I do a lot of work from municipalities. I think nine or 10 different towns. I manage their town land. I do a ton of work for, uh, land trust and conservation groups. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Like I do a lot of work for the nature conservancy in, in the Carroll County area out of that office. Um, I do a bunch of work for the Forest Society, different land trusts, you know, uh, Lakes Region Conservation Trust, Upper Saco Valley Land Trust, Moose Mountain Regional Greenways. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I like working for a lot of groups like that. I actually, uh, you know, for, I don't know, probably 15 years, I was on the board of directors of a small land trust um, in, in Ossipee in, in 2000 and what, 20, I guess we merged with another or were absorbed by a larger land trust just because we were an all volunteer board and just got more than we could handle. Most of the members on the board were fairly old. And I now just sit on the stewardship and lands committee. I'm off of a board of directors. So that's a good thing. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've, you know, and something for the last probably 25 years, I was chairman of my town conservation commission for a while in the early 2000s you know it's something that i believe pretty strongly in is land protection and land conservation it's pretty critical to <laughs> what i do for work so you know i've i put in a lot of volunteer time on that end but i enjoy working for a lot of those groups as well it's a stable land ownership you know i mean i have a ton of private land i manage and there's nothing worse than you know the people that you've put 30 years worth of work into their property you've managed it you've done a couple really responsible harvests next thing you know someone dies the kids sell it and it's got houses growing on it it's like mm -hmm. well so much for all that yeah we had uh, i don't know if you listened to all the episodes of northwoods but i recently had mark Boshane on yeah and we talked about some of the uh habitat fee and what you know the, some of those funds go toward yep. and it's something that i'm super passionate about i'm glad you brought it up um, you know, Northwoods only, we, we are what we are right now, but hopefully we grow. And my passion in this whole endeavor, to be honest with you, is conservation. And it's conservation um, for land, but to keep it open, you know, Mark and I have talked about it a lot. How we like to hunt, like you, you just said, your grandfather doesn't like to hunt around because he looks, he sees the fence that needs mending. The same happens to me. You know, work emails. Yeah. And I love my wife dearly, but I come home and it's, hey, babe, can you help me fold the laundry? We have to do this. What about this bill? When you go to camp, you are immersed in the thing that you're doing. Yeah. And the thing that you're doing is, is hunting. And my personality is such that my brain doesn't stop. And the only real connectivity and presence that I really truly ever have is when I'm in nature. And more specifically, when I'm tracking a buck. And, I mean, big woods hunting, all of it, but specifically tracking for me because you're so engaged in that thing. And what does that take? It takes land and a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So for all the listeners out there that don't know about the habitat fee, that don't understand conservation and, and what it all is, keep listening to Northwoods because there's going to be a lot more conversation um, on it, and we're going to try and – generate some funds to be able to protect the resource that's which, spectacular which that's I'm a great super passionate about yeah well i'd like to if you're gonna dive into that going forward i'd love to be a part of the conversations about it because you know I've, it's something like i said i'm 20, pushing 30 years into it at this point and you know i'm pretty passionate about it and so yeah. when you're doing some of this land management, have you ever been like on a piece of land and been like, ah, I'm, I'm going to come back here and then use some of that information and, and harvest a buck? Or you oh, God, yeah. I, yeah. We call it work hunting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't happens. know, maybe like, oh, God, I don't know how many deer I've shot at work. Quite a few. <laughs> um, I got one in Maine two three years ago i was cruising a piece of land uh and a cruise is uh doing the inventory work and so you're running transect lines and every so many feet you're taking a sample point so i had my clipboard in my left hand and my gun in my right and i'm going along and it was in a unit i had a doe tag for and uh 
a deer popped up out of this thick softwood regen, took two or three bounces. I dropped the clipboard, picked the gun up, and I just said, next time he comes up out of that softwood, when I get that arc, I'm going to let him have it because he was fairly close. Or, And uh, I wasn't sure if it was a buck or doe, and I didn't care because I had a doe tag. I just said, whatever this is, is getting shot. And I folded it up. It ended up being a nice little seven-pointer. Awesome. So, Yep. And it was one of those things where it's like, well, guess I'm not going to finish this up today. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, actually, and then the very next year, I checked on that timber sale I had going over there where Bruce and Dave were working in the morning and took my gun for a walk up on the mountain after I <laughs> painted some wood for them and shot a nice buck up in there. So, we were, You got that one there on Turkey Street. Oh, yeah, that's right. That we pulled ago. that out with a skitter. skitter I like yeah. that. Um, yeah, we were showing this other kid, Chris, there that worked for us. Um, it was a lot. We were actually doing some scarifying, not so much logging it. We'd already cut it in the summer. And we had a scarifying drag that we'd pull behind the skitter for uh, exposing mineral soil. It's really good for getting pine regeneration. So I was walking Chris around, showing him the areas that we needed done. And it was in November. It was the last day of muzzleloader season, that Tuesday. And uh, jumped up a really nice buck who was bedded down with a doe. And uh, they took off. I didn't have my gun with me. It was back in the truck. So uh, we went back. I grabbed my gun and went back out there. And I got fairly close to where I thought they were. And uh, I blatted a couple of times like a cat, like a fawn or or. I don't know how to describe it. Like a doe bleed, I guess. I I call it like a calf blat from living on the farm. But anyway, and a different buck. It wasn't as good as the one I saw, but a nice little, was it a six or an six eight? Six or an eight, a small eight. Yeah, I don't remember. He came charging down the hill. I'm assuming he had just lost out on that doe, and he thought maybe there might have been another one there, but he ran down the hill. Like, I couldn't believe that it was working. When I heard the deer coming, I'm sitting there going, that can't be a deer coming. There's no way in hell. It came running down the hill right to me. I was like, well, that'll work. Boom. And, uh, yeah, the skitter was right there. We were able to go hitch it up and drag the thing right up. So the interesting part about that is it wasn't a tipper can or anything. You did it with your mouth. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, for me, the noise that I make is what, like, a, a, a calf cow, not a deer or anything, right. but the noise that a calf cow makes when it's calling for its mother is what I kind of associate those tipper cans to. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've been making that noise my whole life, just screwing around with the cows. So, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, uh, one thing that I've picked up listening to some of these podcasts in – you know, not just the Northwoods podcast, but other podcasts like the Elmer Boys and some of the others is a lot of guys do quite a bit of mouth calling stuff. And I don't, I feel like I need to do more of it. You know, I tend to go quiet. Usually I'm tracking a buck and I'm like trying to be quiet. I don't want to know I'm there. So I don't always think of it. I do yep. blow and I, and I do blat like after I jump them, but I don't do a ton of calling, which makes me think maybe i gotta dabble a little bit more in that i don't do a ton of the whatever that noise is bleeding or whatever you'd call it but in the last couple of years i started screwing around with a grunt tube a little bit when i'm still hunting and i started doing it only when i could see a deer just to see what their reaction was and you know and i i'm not a great caller or anything but they're interested in it like when i the first time i did it I could see a deer and I grunted a bit and it wasn't a big buck or anything, but he was real interested and kind of came wandering over. Um, and I would say I've probably, I don't know, three or four deer have come to me from grunting. Um, they've never been a big one. It's always been a small, smaller bucks that I think are just, you know, interested and they come sneaking in. Um, the only thing, thing that i've ever called that literally came charging in was that one up there and i think that was just that set of circumstances right there where there was a hot doe a bigger buck had her all cordoned off and he thought maybe he was going to run right in and find something else and he was in a hurry i guess <laughs> right so um i want to dive into a story and i've got one teed up in my brain because I don't remember what year it was, but I remember Mark called me, and we hunt a similar area. 
uh, you and I, as as it may be, yep. which is, you know, it's a small world. The woods get smaller and smaller. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you get out in some of these pieces and you're like, I'm the only one that's going to be hunting here because you're so deep. And then it's like, I get a text from Mark. Yeah. Tim shot a buck there last year. <laughs> uh, but let's hear that one. You know, the one I'm talking about. I'm not going to name any spots, but it's uh, there's a big river near there. You had a drag oh, and a yeah. pot, you oh, hurt your back. Jesus Christ, yes. All right. <laughs> so that was uh, that was the culmination of the best three days of hunting I've had in my life. Um, we had, it was early in the main season. Um, you know how sometimes, depending on the calendar, main season can start like October 26th or 7th. Like last year. This year it's going to start late. Yeah. So we, we had got snow like a foot of snow on the Sunday between residence day and main season opening. And my buddy Dana and I went up there and we got a, <laughs> the worst motel room ever. Uh, but we went up on Sunday and getting up to where there, we had to go up over this pretty good elevation road. And, uh, you know, the snow is deep enough up top. We were dragging pumpkins trying to get up through. We had to stop and cut trees and that. We got down there. And so we hunted. And it was perfect because the temperature stayed like 31 degrees. So the snow never really melted. It didn't crust. It just stayed like the way just felt, perfect. Yeah. But we, um, so we hunted one piece. And this is National Forest. Um, but we hunted one piece. um one day we both ended up tracking a buck. I don't think either one of us got a look at it that first day on Monday, um, but just ran ourselves ragged, you know, good day. The next day I saw hands down the biggest bodied buck I've ever seen in my life and frigged up on it because way back in there. And I see, a doe and it go. And I thought my first thought was I jumped it. God damn it. And I stopped still. And I said, well, I'm clearly going to go. And Dana and I had, you know, not walkie talkie radios, but whatever. Not that we were hunting close together, but we were up high enough and we had kind of a rough plan. We'd left in the morning. I was going way over this way. He was going this way. And we said at noontime, let's both try and be up high enough that we can check in and just see what's going on. And so I, before I did anything with those deer, I said, well, I'm just going to scoot up here a couple of knobs up the ridge, and I think that I'd be looking over towards the valley where he was, and I'll just let him know that I'm headed on this. We'll see you back at the hotel tonight. And so I did that, couldn't get a hold of him, and I come right back down to where I was standing, and those deer had run right back by me. I didn't jump them. He was chasing that doe. He went out and just did a quick little loop and came running right back within 50 yards where I was standing and headed down over the side of the mountain. If I just stayed there, I think they'd have run right back by me. But it was just one of those ones, body size. I mean, yeah, I don't even know. You know, it just... Bigger than the one you got. Yeah, and the one I got's the biggest deer I've ever shot. <laughs> right. Uh, and this was substantially bigger. What strikes me, you know how we all know this... You have images burned in your mind, and that's the image of that. For me, it was how deep it was in the chest and how long and how its belly carried all the way back through from the bottom of its chest right back to its hind end. It just it looked like a Hereford with horns. It really was something else. Um, so I chased that deer that afternoon until it pitched down over the wrong side of a mountain headed way way away and i just said no we're, i ain't going that way um big big hoof on him oh yeah i mean you know where he's headed yeah yeah um and so anyway mm-hmm. i bailed out of there and i had probably a cup hour and a half a, a daylight when i got back to my truck and i said well you know there's this other gated you know forest service road i said i'm gonna just run up at a couple of miles to the end and see if there's any activity up there thinking about the next day and uh, I got all the way up into the end of it. I'd crossed a couple small tracks, nothing, nothing much. But uh, there was a big old log landing that the Forest Service had kind of maintained as a wildlife opening up there. And I sat down, and it's, you know, 4 o'clock. It's getting dark. I'm absolutely whooped. I'm having a sip of water, and I think I was eating a granola bar. Looking out at this, you know, 
probably two acre wildlife opening. When I say that kind of brushy raspberry bushes, that sort of stuff, all of a sudden here comes this bear walking out into it. Not a big bear, maybe 150 pounds. And I had a bear tag, but I had no interest in shooting that that far back that late in the day. And so it walks out in there and, uh, I actually ended up getting a video of it. I got up and I walked closer to it and then they had piled up some rocks there and that bear climbed up onto that rock pile. And by that point I was maybe, I'd walked up to where I was 50, 60 yards from it. And that bear's looking back down the bottom of that edge, kind of in the direction I'd come up. And I hollered at him. I was like, hey bear, hey bear. And finally he whipped his head around and off he went. And I was like, well, that was pretty darn cool. And, uh, so I went back and, uh, kind of got organized and I start walking right back down the same road I'd come. Well, it turns out while I was sitting there dicking around with my phone, that bear was looking down at three deer, a buck and two does that were standing in the road, looking at me, look at the bear. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great big hoof on it. Totally different. Not the deer I was chasing earlier, but there was definitely two does and a big old buck. And they took off running. And those tracks were not there when I walked up by five minutes earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just said, well, you moron. I chased, I followed that track out, but I only probably had half an hour till it was dark. And so the next morning I said, well, I'm going to go right back up in there. I drove to that gate first thing. And uh, there was another truck park there. I'm like, well, I'll go somewhere else. So I, I went down and uh, crossed, um, crossed over good sized river and there's an old road that runs up along it and uh i headed up along that road and i wanted to get over there's a big set of beaver flowages between that road and the mountain and i kept bumping into that bog trying to get across it without getting wet and a good sized brook and uh couldn't finally i got across it as soon as i got across that i picked up a really nice buck track you know good hoof on it and uh he was cruising traveling so i started following him and i went not that awful far, maybe from where I picked his track up three quarters of a mile or so. And he was gradually running up these shelves. And uh, all of a sudden he got onto a shelf that just was full of feeding sign. There was some oaks there that had acorns and uh, big oaks, a lot of understory fir and hemlock and patches, you know, where you could see real good, but then there's spots you can't see. And, uh, I'm going along and all of a sudden, you know, there's just running tracks everywhere. And I'm sitting there, I've got my head down. I'm trying to make sense of it. And in the back of my head, I can hear my dad saying, get your head out of your ass. You're there, you know? And so I pick my head up and start still hunting. And all of a sudden here comes a, a doe running back down over what the shelf kind of quartering towards me. And I'm like, Oh, that's a doe. And I'll, I hear a grunt and it's like, Oh, here we go. And, uh, he was following her and she came in towards me and then she angled away and he was coming and I think he saw, I couldn't see him at the time, but I'm guessing he saw that she'd angled. So he didn't come all the way down her track. He was cutting across that shelf and I just got enough glimpses. Oh, there's plenty of horns there. And, uh, the next opening he came to, I dumped him. Um, but that was, that's the heaviest deer I've ever shot. And what did he weigh? He was 211. Field dressed. Yeah, oh yeah, everything. Yeah, like cleaned and, and actually. Yeah, you want to be able to open their mouth out and see out their asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I make that comment because I, Yeah. you know, I, I think there's a lot of guys that, you know, the 200-pound thing's a coveted thing. and Oh, yeah. I, and we all know them, you know, yeah. the people that every deer that shoots 200 pounds. But, yeah. you know, the, the three of us sitting here together have collectively shot. Uh, you sent me some pictures. I've got two that are over 200. And you've shot a pile of impressive deer. Yeah. Mark's shot a pile of impressive Only deer. one 200-pounder. And I've shot a few, right? I mean, I shot a handful of mature bucks. And I've got two. Two. You've got two. I got one. And you got one. Yeah. So, so but that was... anecdotal data for you. Yeah. And that was Halloween day. That was early in the season. Like, I didn't think he was going to go 200. Um, oh, and then the drag out. That's, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's where the story that's... now it gets interesting. So I knew I had to cross that beaver flowage. And I didn't want to drag him down and hit that beaver flowage and not be able to cross. So I said, well, what I'm going to do is take my gun and my coat and all that and pitch down over and find a good spot to cross, get that across, you know, get all that lug to cross and then come back for the deer. I did that and I ended up, it wasn't an awful spot. We 
I brought him across a beaver dam. He slid off once. I had to wrestle him back up out of that. Got him out to this trail. And then uh, my dad, years ago, when we hunted up in the National Forest, he built himself a cart for lugging deer. It's uh, got front tires on motorcycles. Yeah, dirt bike tires. Yeah, dirt bike tires on it. It's, my dad was a welder machinist, so, I mean, it's, it's nice. It's got brakes. Uh, and it's high enough that you can roll over stuff real good. I mean, we've taken some, oh. carried some deer miles on it. So once I got him to this old road trail, I went back to the truck. It was about a mile and a half. And uh, there's one spot where they'd pull the bridge, and it was a pretty good gully with a brook. And, of course, it was up. So I was, you know, to get across that, I was well up over my knees in the water. Went back, got the cart, got him out there, got him loaded on the cart. And then I'm saying, geez, he might weigh more than I thought, you know, after wrestling him up on there. Brought him out. And, of course, I get to that washed-out brook, and it's probably like 10 feet, 12 feet down from the road down into that. And I'm like, oh, I don't, you know. So I take him off the cart, and I get him down in there. And we get washed downstream, and I get him lodged the, under a rock. The current took him and got him lodged. And so to get him out, I had to go farther downstream, and the gully that the brook is in is getting deeper. So I get him up, and then I'm trying to get him up the other side of this, just sliding back down. The snow's six, seven, eight inches deep with wet snow. Finally, I had to use ratchet straps and hook him and ratchet strap him, like come along him up the side of that bank and got him up to the top. Went back, got the cart, waded back through the brook again, loaded him back on the cart, got the rest of the way out. And then I'm sitting there trying to get him in the back of my truck. And I am absolutely spent by this point. I'm just, he keep pulling him up and he'd fall back down, pull him up, fall back down. This old guy stops and he's like, can I give you a hand? And he comes over and he, nothing. I was like, you know, <laughs> you're just going to hurt yourself. <laughs> Finally, I managed to get him dragged up onto a bank and then drive the truck down into the ditch. I managed to get him in the truck, but that was quite a session. Oh, well, you were, you were lame for a week after that. Yeah. <laughs> As I recall. Those, yeah. those, I've, I've said it before and I'm going to say it probably many more times. The suffrage is what, the more you suffer, the harder the hunt was, the more rewarding it was. And then when you have it all culminate. Yeah. That's probably what led to three of the best days of hunting of your life. And then to shoot the deer. Absolutely. Know, the big boy. And So do, would you say you do quite a bit of tracking? Is that your preferred method? Or Not nearly as much as you guys do. Just because I don't go up north as much as you do. I hunt mostly, you know, Carroll County, Oxford County, lower Oxford County. I mean, don't get me wrong. If it snows, I track. And I've shot deer track. And that year I ended up getting my New Hampshire deer track and as well right. um that was, that was that picture of all of us in flap shop there yeah that's that right year. and that one i mean that same year that what was that 187 that, that was, was a rack buck too oh yeah 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 um is i mean i like i said i don't do as much track and i do more still hunting um just because i don't have the snow but given the opportunity i certainly do yeah. um this year i did a fair little bit i got my main buck track and i chased a lot up in maine we had some pretty good snow actually um but anyway, um, oh, shit, I was headed somewhere. Oh, what I was going to say is that was um, Halloween day, yep. third day of the season I shot that. It went 211. The other deer I got over 200 pounds was the last Sunday of New Hampshire season. So that's generally what, like the 4th, 5th, 6th of December. He went 205. And you wow. look at his body was way bigger. I mean, he was... There was nothing left of him, no fat, just completely spun right out and still went over 200 pounds. Length. Length makes a difference. Yeah. It really does. Long, long yep. way up. The one I killed this year in Maine, <clears throat> he only weighed one, I don't even remember now, was it 181? Yeah, it was something. 180 something. Um, but that deer laying there, like before I took his guts out and stuff, he was so long. And mm -hmm. I'm like, man, if I killed him, you know, in October or early November, you know, you got to think. You know, I used to do some MMA stuff, jiu-jitsu, and I used to train with these guys that would cut 30 pounds a oh, month. Yeah. When you dehydrate your body, like yep. I, I wonder how much, and I think I've said this in a past podcast, but I wonder how much these deer, it's dehydration. I mean, when, how many times are you tracking a buck and they go over to a brook and start drinking? Never. No, not very Never. No. They just go and go and go. They don't eat. They don't drink. You know, and you can tell by their frame, and that's why, like I say to people all the time, Listen, I want to shoot 10, 200 pounders. It's, it's been my goal since I was a kid. It's still a goal. Um, 
I'm leaning more towards the racks as I get older. The bone that goes in the wall lasts a lifetime. The meat that goes in the freezer lasts a season. Um, but I, I, I think that a lot of these mature bucks that we're shooting, they're in the 170s and 180s in October and early November. They probably were 200 pounds. Oh yeah, you know. So they're all they're all trophies in my mind. Yep. It, it, the hunt's the trophy for me, like that. Exactly. You know, that's and I know where you killed that deer, and that's some rugged country for the listeners that you know don't know. It's when he says he was in a ravine, I'm pretty sure I know the ravine, and that's a that's a real one. <laughs> yeah, it was so disheartening when we because I was dragging him across, and when we, I lost him to the current, and he got swept downstream and lodged up underneath that rock. I'm watching, and it's like I'm screwed. Like I could see it happening. It was just like this isn't good. <laughs> How are we going to resolve this problem? Yep. You but, guys ever drug any bucks out together? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm there for all of his shitty drags, and he's there for none of mine. <laughs> I got some buddies that well, say the same yeah, That's me. not necessarily how it plans out. How many miles was that <laughs> there? Three and a half miles? Uh, yeah, we used the Oh, car. we don't speak of <laughs> but ble- Bleep that out. Beep, beep, beep. beep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was three and a half that miles. Was three and a half. That, that deer scored 144. Yeah, seven. That was my dad. Was we were Mark and I were out there. Is that all, your one or his? Mine. I Yours. was out one. That was a big tall eight. Tall eight. Yeah. Yeah. Nice um, I was out there lower down on the hill. It's a beautiful ridge that if you can get way out there, you can run it back with the wind in your face and could, it would bare ground. And I was down kind of at the base of it where there's some swamps and some hemlock, and he was up quite a ways up the ridge. You know, more or less running parallel back for that few miles. And my dad was in. What mile yeah, or so yeah, from the mile, road, yeah. and uh, Mark shot, and uh, there is cell phone service there. And I called my dad up, and he says, "I heard that shot, and knew how, how far out there we were." He says, "I almost shut my goddamn phone off." <laughs> 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 so he ended up going back and getting that same cart we're talking about, the sl- uh, slaying cart, the slaying cart, and uh, we loaded that thing on. I mean, the problem was is. Um, he shot it up on this wicked steep ridge and we couldn't just bring it right straight down the ridge because there's a big scree slope and if you made it through that you'd be right in the swamp so we for probably well i can remember hooting a bunch trying to get you up there and oh you finally got up there huffing and puffing and he's like i got stuck in that scree slope <laughs> yeah i i know where he's at i can hear him but i'm trying to get up through this rock scree slope and i have to keep switch back and back and climbing up and i got up to him i said we're not dragging it downhill so we had to drag it side hill for probably three quarters of a mile before we could pitch down over. It was so steep that we ended up tying my dragon rope onto the tail of the deer. And I was at the ass end of it, keeping the deer from sliding downhill while he pulled it forward. That was a good time. Yeah. Now wasn't, (laughs) wasn't that a super long drag too? Well, to get him out of the woods, it was, I don't know, three miles, three and a half miles. That's a super long drag. But we had the cart, the slaying cart. For the last couple miles, it was rolling. Does this cart still exist? Oh yeah. Ah, we need to get a picture of that thing. I got to see that. Yeah. That's it, it. It's a slick rig. Yep. Um, Sounds it. And then uh, the other one that was over two miles was that one um, that one with the lobster claw front on its yep. antler. Yep. He's, I'd already, that, that, was, that, that was late in the year. Yeah, that he, was probably my best hunt I've ever had, my most memorable. Well, let's hunt. hear it. Let's t- dovetail this thing together. All yeah. right. So, I'll weigh in when we get to the shitty drag part. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was that week I took off. I always took that last week off. Yep. So it was the last week of December. And I was the, done hunting, right? Hunting. Yeah, you were at work. <laughs> I always took that Thanksgiving to the end of the season off. And uh, it was, must have been the last Wednesday of the season. It was getting down there in time. And, we had some horrible snow for tracking, but I was going to track. So I tracked this. It was crusty, right? Crusty. It was like wa- walking on light bulbs. And I ended up tracking this deer all day. And I bumped him up, and I'd bump him up. And I was, you know, he'd follow him, follow him. He'd slow down. Tracks would get tighter together. And I'm like, all right, he's going to be laid down on this bench up here. And I'd start sneaking and sneaking. But you can't sneak in crust that goes smash and... You hear the chunk sliding down the hill. Tink, 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 yeah. tink, tink. Yeah, you're not, you're not sneaking through that. And I'd get close, but I'd never see him, but I'd hear him take off. And I said, well, it's getting late in the day. This next time, 
I get close to him, it's going to be my last opportunity. So I got to do something different. And I said, I'm just going to walk. Just keep on walking. Just, I got to do something. Crunch up on them. Crunch up on them, yep. So that's what I ended up doing. And I don't know if I j- bumped him or what, but he was coming back down along this little seasonal drainage. And he didn't get much further once we crossed paths. And I don't know, it must have been, it was right after 3, 3.15 in the afternoon. I was just getting ready to leave work yeah. after, uh, at the end of the day, yeah. and he sends me a picture of it dead and, uh, and GPS coordinates. <laughs> and I, I'm like, all right, I'm coming. Uh, and I got to the gate. There's a gated road that goes at the base of this mountain. And I got to the gate, and I had my GPS unit, and uh, I, he sent me another set of coordinates based on how far, far he managed to down, drag yeah. it. And I put him in, in a straight line. It was like 1.78 miles in a straight line. And I'm looking at him like, we're not going in a straight line. <laughs> and I've been dragging on this deer for what, so half hour, 45 minutes already. I And it's getting dark. So yeah. I started hoofing, and I got up in there just as – I made good time. You made good time. You were – yeah. Yeah. And uh, I got up in there, and we muckled on to that thing. And I, it was another one where you couldn't just bring him out straight. We had to bring him down the hill and then pick that road up. And go side hill and out. Yeah, Jesus. It was well dark. Yeah. It was for <laughs> but, me. But, I mean, between the two of us, you know, we muckle on to something. We right. can drag. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Lean it's coming it. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just, for me, that was, it was the most rewarding hunt I've ever had. Just because at the end of the day, I was mentally and physically exhausted, mm-hmm. just trying to figure out, like, how am I going to connect with this thing, you know? Yeah, I think some of it, when, with some of those hunts, like the one you just described, it's a mental thing, too. Because, right. and a lot of people don't understand that, that, you know, listen to these accounts. Like, when you're tracking, you're constantly thinking. You are so engaged in trying to harvest that animal that you're, you second-guess everything you did. You know, you all right, should I give him thirty? Should I give him ten? Should that I was that one. Okay, all right. We'll make sure to give Brooke a picture of this. That's just a little thing. Yeah, that's Is that, that like w- twenty plus inside. That was twenty, twenty two, twenty one inside. It's a giant. Yeah, it's a giant. So, uh, yeah. Well, I've learned Mark doesn't really. He doesn't come running on the uh, drags. <laughs> I shot one this year, and we were hunting. We were within earshot on the radios, and he says, "You got that all right, don't you?" <laughs> well, I asked. You're gonna get that out. It was, that's you... in sales. We call that an assumptive close. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll see. I'd make a good salesman, wouldn't yes, I? Yes, you would. Yeah, I get. I get that buck there in New Hampshire, and I mean, in in all fairness and truth, I I did say, "Listen, guys, I got it." You know, because it was like, I think I killed him at like 11:30. Yeah, it's like I don't yeah. care if it takes all day. Keep hunting. You, you know, know I've let everyone of, else go. I've heard lots of guys say it's it's the most fun hard work that you'll you'll do, and there's nothing like being, you know, you've got nothing else to do to do. You're just gonna muckle yep. all of this thing and drag it. I had to go through a couple brooks, and um, it ended up being a little bit more difficult, you know, because you look on the, you know, we use GPSs or Onyx and. You're just looking as the crow flies. You're not really looking at the topography. In this particular area that I'd shot the deer, I hadn't hunted in a bunch. Um, but it was an absolute shithole between me and where I had to go. But it was yep. it was still fun, and I, I didn't really need help. It would have been – I like the camaraderie of it. Yep. Like, you know, when your friend comes, you're enjoying that, that moment, that experience. And then, like, what you and Mark are talking about right here, you're reliving that. You have somebody to – you know, Mark and I um, – Double teamed a couple bucks yeah. in the last couple of years. We both shot deer, I think two years in a row. We both got Maine, New Hampshire bucks, and we're like, let's go to Vermont. And we messed around in Vermont and just, you know, no pressure, just yeah, taking, t- yeah chasing them around the mountains. And and uh, there's a lot of a lot of laughs. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd fall, I'd laugh, I'd <laughs> fall, he'd laugh. He'd go in a beaver bog. Yep. You know, some yeah stuff. I can. Well, I had wounded a deer. This was, oh, God, pushing 10 years ago now. And he and I were blood trailing it. And uh, actually, I had hit it the first time and was following it. And he got out in front of it. And he got two more into it. And the thing's still going. And, uh, 
you know, we're talking about laughing as we got out into this great big old beaver bog that's all grown up with swale grass and that. And you could see where the deer had crossed this brook and had gone up the other side. And I looked at him and I was like, you think we can jump that? And he's like, probably not. And I was like, well, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> here, here, Mark, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I looked at him. I said, we're going to remember this. <laughs> or I said, I don't remember what I said. It was something along the lines of we're going to talk about this. And I didn't make it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I was two thirds of the way across. So, you know, by the time I hit the water. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that deer, like I said, I hit it once. He ended up putting two into it. He shot three times, hit it twice, running out across a clear cut. And we followed that thing till dark. It was Thanksgiving Day. I messed, and we had our buddy Caleb involved with it too. So it oh, followed yeah, up yeah. all three of our Thanksgiving dinners. We had some pissed off wives. Yeah, whatever. They... And then the next day, we went back, and uh, I got onto the blood trail again. And I, Mark was, I think you'd gone up to camp, yeah. but I had uh, my buddy Dana um and caleb and his dad and we ended up we've never found the deer the bleeding had come right down to just about nothing but as part of that hunt our buddy dana who hunted a little bit as a kid but had kind of given it up and was just he wasn't that into it um he ended up shooting his first deer that day because we had lost it in a different section of the same bog and caleb and i were pushing through seeing if we could jump it up drive it out and we put Dana down in one spot and Blair up in another and Caleb jumped up a really nice buck and ran it right to Dana and he shot it and it was his first year ever and we were all there and it was so friggin' cool and I think he's got a deer every year since then he's hooked yeah he got hooked Killer. completely hooked. it's all he thinks about and talks about now but he was I mean if he's 10 years old he was probably 35 when he shot his first deer no kidding and the excitement and just being there uh was one of the best things ever and i've got another good friend of ours uh hunted for the first time in his 40s and he got his first year two years ago and um i wasn't too i don't even think i was hunting but i was close enough by that i went over and showed him how to gut it and all of that and i don't know i think that was one of the coolest things those two guys you know full-grown adults but getting them to be there when they shoot there or be you know they're right after they shoot it and the excitement that's cool it's it, really cool it, it, it's my probably the biggest thing i miss about guiding is the connectivity that you get with the hunters yeah i'll never forget it i did some guiding with jason parent um new hampshire guide service it was i think they changed it to northern new england outfitters and he had hired me to just like help he had got a client, and it was these two guys. They were in their 70s. God, I wish I remembered their names. Um, and they didn't. They kind of booked me as a uh, semi-guided hunt, so they had me for a weekend, like a Saturday, Sunday, to open a New Hampshire hunt. This was back in, I want to say, 2007 or six, something like that. It was brutal. I mean, it was 70 degrees, and it was a J2 hunt, so this zone where we're in right now, yeah. so not an overly – you know, Moosey right. zone. It's not moose trampling. <laughs> yeah. It's not like in northern New Hampshire. And I'd done a little scouting. Jason had helped me. And, and I was on, in a spot, actually, ironically, not as the crow flies too far from where we're sitting here. But um, we hunted hard. I pushed these guys for two full days. Again, in their mid-70s. Older gentlemen. They were into beekeeping, um, honeys. They grew giant pumpkins, which, remember, you oh, were yeah, into oh, for I, a little I bit. grew some. Yeah. And just... Salt of the earth people, and I felt so bad. We hunted so hard for two days, and they were, you know, they were feeling it after a couple of days of trudging around the woods in seventy degree weather. Yeah, and so we had we'd gone back to the truck. We we're having some lunch, and I said, "Guys, just just sit here for a minute. I'm going to take a walk." I just with them, I had to go really slow, and I just wanted to go run yeah. and just see if I could see something to get me excited to either give me a charge or give them a charge, just something. You know, you know how it is. Oh yeah. And so I'd gone up and I did this big loop and I cut this track that I'm telling you, man, it was, there was smoke rolling out of it. It's bare ground, but it was just moose are big animals. When they walk in the woods, they leave mm-hmm. spore. And so I tracked them a little ways on bare ground and I see a pile of poop and I pick it up like I always do. And I taste it. No, not really. Um, I picked it up and saw, I mean, it's green, you know, you break it up. It's yeah. still warm. I'm like this moose and it's 70. They don't, yeah. as you well know, they don't go anywhere. 
So I run back down the trail. I'm like, guys. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I, 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 you finish up your water. I need one last push. And I, I back up for a second. I had given them an extra day. So I would Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Meanwhile, I was supposed to go out and help with a hunt up north. And, but I gave him the day on me. I said, guys, I'm giving you another day. Don't, don't worry about any charges or whatever. And long story short, we get up there. We start tracking this moose, which obviously bear ground tracking is arduous. And I'm just picking my way and my head's down. And all of a sudden the moose was bedded and he got up and, you know, moose aren't the fastest animals in the world. And they're pretty easy to shoot running because they don't bound like a deer. Yeah. And he took off, and I went right there. And I kind of, like, ducked because the guys were behind me. I want to get shot in the back. And boom, boom, they both shoot. Actually, no, the, the one guy shot. And, I mean, I watched him shoot. The, the gun came to about his hip. <laughs> the, he was not, you know, line of sight, you know, aiming. And, and I just see the moose disappear. And I'm like, you on safe? He's like, yep. Yeah. I said, all right, come with me. And we go running up there. And there he lay. He'd spined him, and we end up finishing him off. And I'll never forget. It was super warm. I called my dad. He showed up with the ATV and ATV trailer because that's how we were going to get out of the woods. And, you know, we had our little moment, high five, hugging, celebrating. And they're like, if you don't mind, we'd like to field dress the moose. It's something that we're, you know, we're capable of. And we'd like to do it. I said, well, listen, you guys get going on it. I'm going to go get some, my dad, he'd get some blocks of ice, get them, you know, get them cooled off. And so I'd gone back, met my dad, came back up and they had finished field dressing it, which they did a good job on. And they were both hugging and like, tearing up a little bit you know and i'll be honest with you i teared up a little bit for me to have that experience with them and just see the joy in the genuine excitement and me to be the facilitator of mm -hmm. that i was hooked still am like i love guiding for moose i mean i love guiding for anything um but so what you were just talking about with that you know yeah there's it, it, nothing like it and i think that's a I think that's a profound experience when you're so passionate about a thing to then see somebody else get joy in the thing that you're so passionate about. It's undescribable, really. Yep. Well, I think so my buddy John, he was the same way. Started hunting in his mid-30s or something like that, you know? And I think you have a, a greater respect for it than you do if you were, you know, 10, 12 years old and got your first animal. Not that you don't respect it, but... It's different. It's totally different. It's, you know, like... Yeah. I you mean, understand the the difficulty it was to get this animal and, and you know, what it's going to be. It's going to be food. It's going to be, you know, for your family for the next year. You know, it's... it. I think it's more meaningful, probably. Well, you've got a fully life. developed adult brain. It's not like you're an 11 year old kid who, right. I mean, I remember it as being unbelievably cool, but it's just, it's different. You know, you're not a grown up. You don't, you're not processing things the same. Right. Um, yeah. So you spoke of food. Do you, do you ever eat venison? I've been known to. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark told me something. And I think he's probably misspeaking when he says this. But he claims that you ate venison, and that was the only red meat that you ate for a whole year. Oh, yeah, most years. Like, I mean, I'll, if I eat beef half a dozen times a year, that's, yeah, I eat deer meat. So you, you literally, own, I mean, basically eat deer meat. Yeah, pretty much. That's awesome. I mean, I do like cow. It's it's yep. good and all, but I end up with freezer full of venison, so that's what I eat. Yep. My wife doesn't eat much meat. I mean, not that she objects to eating meat. She just doesn't care for it. But my daughter and I will eat three deer a year. Given that's awesome. the Yeah. Yeah, we eat a ton. I mean, I tend to, again, in these little um, phases where I kind of like get into cooking other things, I'm like, God, I got to eat venison again. But I mean, venison is part of our diet. I mean, I had venison burgers last night. Next yeah, I had yeah, steak right. last night and a leftover steak sandwich for lunch today. And uh, so you weren't you weren't fit. The lying. man eats venison. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, currently doing the carnivore diet, so you are? all I'm eating is meat. There yeah, you go. it's been it's been a pretty cool experience. It was just a quick quick story on it. Um, somebody at work was chatting about it, like, "Hey, think about doing carnivore." And I'm like, "You know, I've listened to some podcasts and whatever." It's intrigued me a little bit, you know, listen to Joe Rogan. And then, um, like, the next 
couple days later, I was at a friend's house and we were playing poker. And the guy that was there, I'd met and I didn't recognize him. He's like, you've met me. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, you look familiar. Anyway, he'd lost like 47 pounds and he was doing what he called the low um, inflammatory diet. He had MS and big, big hunter. Uh, actually, I think I'd met him with my buddy Lance prior to. But anyway, he um, he he basically was like, the diet that I'm doing is basically a carnivore diet. I mean, I eat some fruits and select vegetables and, and, and some uh, avocado. Um, so that was like a couple of days later. Well, then three days later, we, we have a sponsorship that we're, we're working on with Mark Woodman of Woodman Arms, and they're making us a, a custom carbine. 20 inch muzzle loader, um, which should be out soon. I'm hopeful. I call Mark all the time. Mark, if you're listening, can't wait to put my hands on one of those. Um, but I called him. He just ran in the Boston Marathon and we started chatting. And I was like, you know, I want to give you time before I bugged you on this and just see how things are going on the new gun. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, the, you know, the marathon went well. My recovery was amazing. And I'm like, well, what do you attribute that to? And he's like, oh, I've been eating carnivore now for, I think he said like four or five months. And I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm going to try it. And so I've been on it now for, I think, a couple weeks will make three months. Oh, wow. And I did, like, my blood work and stuff, and it was amazing. I feel great. Uh, my energy levels are phenomenal. Um, I don't drink at all, which I'm sure a lot of, you know. It's just some empty of these, carbs. Some of these benefits are probably because I quit drinking, too. But, um, yeah, it's been good, so. I think you would be a, a, a great candidate for the carnivore diet because it sounds like you all you use venison. Well, you know. <laughs> Although I will say... Mashed my potatoes are pretty darn good. I know. <laughs> um, my buddy uh, had gotten a beef cow from his neighbor, um, and he gave me a couple of good steaks. We ate them, I don't know, last week or the weekend before, and you forget how, how good good, good is. beef is. You know, meat with fat in it, big yeah. fat cap on it. It's <laughs> right. like, boy, that's awful nice. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's one of the things that I've noticed being on this diet is I used to kind of pick around the fat. I'd eat some, but yeah. like, I'd eat with like Pete at work, right. Peter Weeks, um, deer killer himself. But I'd go, like we'd go to dinner or something, he'd get a ribeye, and he'd be like, you're not going to eat all that fat? I'm like, no. Now? Dude, no fat gets. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's amazing. It's the best there. part. Don't, don't waste that. You're... you're <laughs> My, at least for me, my palate's changed in that regard a little bit. But, um, yeah, big venison fan. So you're right. It kind of dovetails everything together because as I've gotten older, like the appreciation in, in, in today's world, I think, especially knowing where your meat comes from. Oh, shit, yeah. Touching it. You guys process it, right? You take it over to the he, farm. Well, he... Mark's given up, I've on given it. up on it. I shoot one, give it to the butcher, and go hunting again. Right, but you did for years. Oh, yeah, yeah and absolutely. To be honest with you, I'd love to process my own. I'll be honest, it's my own selfish drive that makes me go mm -hmm. drop it off at the butcher and because you right. only get a month. That's, and, that's why. And after it, I'm going to be dreaming about it for the rest of the year. So I want to capitalize on the time that yeah. I have to be able to actually physically hunt if I got to process my deer. But I would love to because for all those reasons. You harvested it, and now you're processing it. And and for me, you know, I mean, growing up on the farm, we butchered beef cows. We butchered pigs. Right. We It's just, for me, it's part of it. It always has been from the time I was old enough to get in the way trying to help. I've been cutting up animals. And, you know, most of our crew, and like I said, Mark's given up on it, but everyone else, Maybe we still have to come back. And have a couple we still of years. cut deer. And that's the... The fun part of it is, you know, you get a couple of guys together and generally we have, you know, a big enough group of guys that, you know, sometimes we get a couple to do it once and that, and it's a good time. I think the last one we did in Graham's house there in the basement, um, we had that earthquake. Oh, the that's right. one of mine. Yeah, that we did. that's right. I don't know if we thought the furnace was going to blow up. So over at the farm um, up in what was my grandparents' house, we're set up for butchering. Big industrial Hobart grinder, big long tables, freezer paper, scales, like cooler. I mean, we're set up for butchering beef cows, so this is nothing. So I do have a good situation there. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know how much, how many deer we've cut. I mean, and not just me. I'm talking about the, how my grandfather over that, the years and how many have gone through that that butchering facility there would be hundreds, if hundreds. If those tables could speak. I mean, you sent me that picture of your grandfather with all those hides in the back. I mean, he... Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like I said, he was hell on deer. He, he put a little hurt on him. Yes, he was. Yeah. And, you know, for as many deer as that man shot, there's not a single rack anywhere. 
my dad said he would cut the antlers off before he even dragged them out of the woods. If it was a buck unit, he'd leave three inch stubs or whatever was a legal yeah. thing. There was one set of horns that was kicking around the barn that would have filled a bushel basket that was so big even he had to keep. And I watched him sell it. We were it was in the fall of the year, and uh, we had a sta- we had an apple orchard there, and we we're selling apples. And we had just fruit stand in front of the barn and that. And some guy was in there buying apples, and he looks up. It was set up on top of this uh, old refrigerator just inside the door of the barn that we use for storing gas cans in. And I mean, honest to God, it would have filled a bushel basket is how I would describe this rat. 70 inch deer. And, uh, the guy was so wound up about it and he said, Oh, can I see that? And my grandfather said, yeah, go right ahead. And he got it down. He says, Oh, you know, would you ever sell this? My grandfather's like, I don't know. That was 20 bucks sound. And that, there it went. That was the only set of horns that ever existed from the lifetime of that man shooting deer. And I, you know, in a way is as much as I, as you can see, you're in my house right now, cherish the antlers and, put them on display and put a lot of work into to, to getting them. I, I kind of respect that, you know, because it's, I think in today's world, we're so caught up in the destination and, and, and we, we almost don't want the journey in a way. Yeah. And I think that that right there describes for him, it was the meat. Yeah. Probably almost all of that. Right. But, I'm sure there was that. He loved it. It was the, it, it was for him like getting up to camp and getting and I'm like I said he shot plenty of deer on that farm more than I could probably even <laughs> fathom, but for him getting for that week or two he'd spend up at camp was just it was getting away from the farm it was getting away from work it was getting up into the woods and he just loved it. Yeah. For me, you know, I work in the woods all day every day, and I hunting season is the only time I get to spend in the woods when I'm not at work. And so for me, that's the difference. And I struggle at the beginning of the season to get my brain out of work mode. Cause I'll be walking around looking up at trees and that. And it's like, get your head out of your ass. You're hunting. You're not doing that. And it takes a minute to get going on it. But yeah, it's the only time that I'm in the woods where I'm not working. I know people that are shed crazy at times and, I've hunted with them, and they're. Oh, I was looking for sheds. You're looking for sheds, or you're deer hunting. There's deer tracks everywhere. It's come yeah. on. Yeah, you warned me when I started shed hunting. You're like, you, you know, don't become, you know, so driven. And it's funny, man. I just shift gears. Right. Like, I like to look for moose antlers, but then once it's deer hunting, I'll walk over a moose antler. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Don't, I, could care I can't less. tell you how many I've found. I was just. Oh God. I take f- a picture of it. And like George will look at it and he's just like, You didn't log that out? And I was like, No, I'm deer hunting. Maybe I'll drop a pin on it and come yeah. back, but I not. found a cork and moose antler um tracking in the snow up north this year. And uh I hung it up in a tree just figuring and I mean it was fresh, it still had blood on the the tip of it and some hair. I mean it couldn't it was snowing like a son of a bitch that day and there was snow on it, but I bet you it hadn't been there twenty four hours. I meant to go back this spring and look for the other side and never never got to it. But at the end of the day, I ran that deer. Actually, I ran that deer until I got into a better one and then ran that deer until I ran out of day. And on the way back by, I'm thinking, I'm like, it's probably only a half mile out of the way. I ended up cruising back by and picking that antler up because I was like, it's, you know, I'm four miles from the truck. I'm, it's not going to get any easier, easier than right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing in the woods this year? Are we going to have an acorn crop? Too early know. to tell. Well, I, it's hard telling. Yeah. Tell you how about the beech nuts last year? That I have unreal. never seen beech nuts as widespread and as thick as it was. I couldn't figure the deer out on them though. I feel like they weren't eating them. That's exactly so. They were. I. What it was weren't. is they weren't focusing anywhere. They could eat one here and one there because right. they didn't have to go somewhere. They're still everywhere in the woods. Yeah. Um, that deer I got in New Hampshire this year. Um, we had a very spotty oak crop, and I wandered into a piece of woods that I hadn't probably set foot in in four or five years, and uh, it was a rainy morning, and I hadn't, I, I was having a frustrating beginning into the season. This is New Hampshire, bare ground still. It was kind of a rainy day, and I st- weren't, wasn't finding just 
it was a frustrating start to the year. And I stepped into this piece of woods and there was sign everywhere. There was feeding sign, rubs, scrapes. And I was like, oh, and it's fresh. It had rained overnight and the dirt's still up on top of the leaves and crisp. I was like, oh, here we go. And uh, it had both acorns and beech nuts in it. And it's funny, there were beech nuts everywhere, but this was a little pocket with acorns too. And it was holding a pile of does. And he was in there just running around like Run, nose to the ground just back and forth back and forth and sensory overload yeah he just yeah like mark when he was 18 at the bar right 21 <laughs> 21 i never oh, went right. there when i was that's 18. right yeah allegedly yeah no uh i've seen acorns in the trees at my house yeah uh, yeah i pulled the binoculars out the other day so, and was looking at them so last year early um kirsten and i had gone up where you and i hunted quite a bit mm-hmm. where you did a little um late season looking um same thing beach nuts everywhere and there was this w- couple shelves and all of a sudden there was all these deer tracks like you know this is bare ground obviously in like i'd say august september yeah september and all of a sudden i'm, I'm i literally could hear acorns falling out of the trees you could see them they're on the ground like marbles and i'm like oh my god big four finger track i was wound like i just found him yep. here he is Fast forward, muzzleloader season. I think it was the second day. Cause the first day we hunted in that neck of the woods you described. Oh, with, yeah. With that yeah. bar on the New Hampshire end. Yeah. And um, so we went, the next day we went over there, or I went over there, and went way up on the top. It's, you know, it's a poke in there. And that's what made me so excited is I'm like, this is a mile and a half in plus. Yeah, no one's going to drive them out of here. No. It's And it's remote, and it's kind of crappy. It's mountainous and ledgy and not pleasant. Well, and um, there isn't a lot of deer either. There's almost deer. no deer. Yeah. But uh, there was a pocket. I'm like, here we go. Not an acorn. Hmm. Every single, like, they must have just all fell early and then they all got picked up. I mean, I mean, I was walking around biting them, you know, because there was yeah. obviously old ones on the ground, but they were all junk. And I had checked the ones that were on the ground and they were good ones in <laughs> September. Just, but. Yeah. Well, if I they mean, fall, correct me if I'm wrong, if they fall with a cap on them, they're no good. They're no good generally. Theoretically, yeah. I have a worm in them, right? Yep. And I've tested that theory since you told me that, and you, you're you're more often than not, you're right. right. Like I bite yeah. into them and they're crap. That um that main deer I got this year, it was into a, a pocket. It was actually it was the same day he got his main deer. Yep. We started in the same spot. It was over in May. Uh, I had a timber sale planned for the area, and I'd been in there. I think I was running boundary lines ahead of it, and. Uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, look at all the buck sign in here. And so Mark and I, we had fresh snow. Was it still snowing or it just wrapped up? It wrapped up before daylight. we started, he headed in his direction, ended up with his deer. I went down into this section, picked up a track. It wasn't an awful big track, but it was, you know, almost the end of main muzzleloader. I was not being fussy. If I seen anything legal, it was dying that day. And all this thick softwood all folded over with the fresh snow and that deer we went around and around and around i bumped him a few times never see him but i mean i'd had been 20 yards from him to to see him in that thick stuff finally i got sopping wet was like the hell with this i knew a spot 10 minutes 15 minutes down the road where it's open woods i was like i know and it's somewhere i'd hunted a bunch this year chase some deer around in so i ended up going over there picking a track up we went up over the mountain quartering down the other side and he finally got into a group of does feeding in the only acorns on that mountain and it was the same thing as i was saying i'm following the track along and all of a sudden there's feeding and sign everywhere and it's that you're here start paying attention and sure enough he was standing there looking downhill and i couldn't see the does but they were all laying down there you could see the beds afterwards and he was just standing there perfectly still just watching them doze. His head was behind a cluster of trees. I couldn't see horns at first. We stood there for a few minutes, and finally he spun his head around. And I said, oh, there's plenty of horns there. Boom. What are you hunting with for a rifle? Um. Well, that was muzzleloader. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um. I've got one of those... Um, I don't even know the name of it. It's the Thompson it's a, Center break open ones. It was LHR. like those LR it, when they took over the patent for those LHR or yeah. strike, I think it's called. Um, and it's all right. Um, I bought it like a year before I became aware of the Woodman ones that Mark bought. Um, and then with rifle season, um, I hunt 
uh, on foul weather, I have a peep sighted pump gun and normal weather, a bolt gun. I actually, my dad passed away here in January of 23. And I hunted this year with the deer rifle that he built. Like I said, he was a welder machinist, really a craftsman with metal. His father, when he got out of the Navy, was a gunsmith. Uh, my dad inherited all of that gun shop and the tools, and he built up a bunch of really, really nice Mauser 98 bolt-action deer rifles. And the very best one he made was his own. He built it in the late 80s. Um, I mean, it's gorgeous. a gorgeous it's gun. Beautiful. Um, you know, I mean, when I say he built it, he, you know, he, it was a bare-barreled action, beautiful scroll engraving on it. But, I mean, he took, he built a banded fright, ramped front sight on it. He built, he did it like, in I guess you'd call it an express style, like the English safari rifles, but it's a thin stocked 30-odd six. Um, he bought a blank piece of English, figured English walnut, carved the stock. Oh, wow. I mean... I can remember in the 80s, my mother coming unglued when she found out he spent 500 bucks on a chunk of wood. And I mean, this is like 1986 when 500 bucks is a lot of money and we didn't have much money growing up. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a work of art and he hunted it from then until, you know, when he got too sick to hunt, but, uh. I shot that deer in New Hampshire with it this year. Yeah, and I must felt have been per- something special. Absolutely. That's cool. I liked that quite a bit. Yeah, I'm sure uh, you did. Well, that's cool. So one of these days we all got to get together and shoot because I the jury's out on me with with the with the uh, peep. Um the 20 22 buck that's on the wall in there. Shot at him 11 times. I heard um, that story on the <laughs> podcast. Yeah. What I didn't say in the podcast, just because I didn't want it to be the th- focal point, was my peep was shooting. Like, and we came back here. I think you were with I me. I shot it. Yeah. And I mean, fifty yards. It was like bottom of the paper. Oh yeah. So it was significantly off. I don't know if I bumped it or just didn't tighten it enough. But like to uh, like to dabble. Um, yeah. I actually just bought a twenty-two pump. Five seventy-two. Yep. I've got one of them. Yeah, what a fun little thing! I can't wait to shoot it some more. I literally bought it. I shot it a couple times out there. It went in the safe, and I've been. Yep. Mark no, and I. They're uh, fun. Busy. I'm a big fan of that. But uh, I'm pretty good with the peep. I mean, I've shot, I don't know, three or four deer with it now. Yeah. Um, and I just use it when I don't want to deal with the scope right. being it fouled up with snow. So good. It's like I just man. Yeah. I it's like. Hard, yeah. It's hard to not want to hunt with them when they carry like that. And the reason I asked is you were talking about seeing the deer and the antlers and do you hunt with the peep? So I'm glad, yeah, you hunt with the peep because... Sometimes, yeah. like I said, foul weather, rainy days, snowy days. Um, sometimes if I know I'm going to hunt some really thick stuff. But I mean, I've, for my entire life, I've hold, hunted with a bolt gun with a scope. Yep. My dad built me, uh, when I was 12, he built me a 30 odd six. Um, and then... I ended up picking up a really nice um, 270 that I hunted with for probably 15 years, shot a pile of deer with. I tell you what, I'm impressed with that caliber. That makes two holes in anything you shoot with it. 270. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Really very happy with that. And uh, this was the first year I went back to a 30-odd six with my dad's gun. Yeah. You run in partitions on that thing. Yeah. 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 Of course. Oh, obviously <laughs> hand load partitions and that's part of our big plan with this new woodman is to not just you know say here's another option for a shorter lighter carbine um which if you've i don't know if you've held his those oh yeah are- I've, every, like i said i bought this muzzleloader i finally broke down and spent money and bought a decent muzzleloader like a year before i became aware of woodman's and yeah too cheap to just (laughs) buy (laughs) another one yeah well we'll see if maybe we can't give you a deal on one but i'll tell you man um they're slick oh my god i've shot his our our friend dana's got one i mean they're the way to go they 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 carry so good and that's that's the thing the way it balances because that's what i like i love my bar i've got a 308 browning ll cody bar the little shorted seracoded i killed my big big eight with that because my pump um, the wood had split. Remember yeah, that year? Yep. And um, 
I was just nervous about it, like coming apart in the woods. And so I'd taken my bar that day. And I love that, but I've got small hands in the way that I carry it. They're pretty blocky. I kind of got to do, you know, it's like a forearm pump by the end of the mm-hmm. day, the way you got to carry it. And the thing with the pumps are how they balance. When you Absolutely. hold them at that pump point, and that's what the, I yeah. mean, there's many things about the Woodman that I like, but. You can hold that Woodman with one finger on that hinge point. And yeah. it balances perfect. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we get that balance point with the carbine. Or, you know, not hoping we're going to get that balance point. And then the other thing that I want is I want to get in like Ryan's hand and obviously Timmy and Mark's in two holes. Oh, yeah. So I want to design a load and the cartridge, which Mark does, to not just be the gun, but here's the recipe. Yeah. Here's the gun and here's the two hole tracking. That's been yeah. my biggest gripe about muzzleloaders is just not getting a couple holes, not getting good blood. It's been frustrating. It's so important the way we hunt to get two holes in a deer. Yeah. Just so you have that good blood trail. I was, well, you uh, gave me those. I got to pee. Yeah. <laughs> pause. Brooke, pause. All right, Brooke, the pee break is over. We're back. Yeah, so, you know, I think having kind of the full recipe because let's face it people like mark and timmy bullduck that that's what they do right they it's like your dad he built the great great gun because he's a you know mechanical engineer and 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 works with that sort of stuff um me i'm a salesman i'm fortunate to have some buddies like mark and ryan who who do hand loads and stuff um but i kind of want to take all the guessmanship out for the average guy like myself. And when you pick one up, here's the recipe. This is what you want to shoot. You know, hundred grains by volume. Here's the bullet. We've R and D'd it. We've shot it. It's going to make two holes. This is a tracking Mm -hmm. puzzle loader for a specific thing. So excited. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Those, those woodmans are sweet. Yeah. Yeah, they are. You guys run the 45 caliber one like Dana, right? Yeah. 45. Yeah. I got a 45. Oh, We'll dig it out of the safe before you leave. I really wish that. <laughs> like I said, I missed it by a year. Yeah. But I don't think I'd switch and go to a 50. The only, not that I have a problem now, because I just buy Woodman's bullets there that he, that they supply. But if you were to go to like Walmart or something like that, it's hard to find 45 caliber projectiles. Oh, yeah, for sure. Components are tough these days. I'm trying to remember. I bought some bullets for my muzzle loader because I was pretty unhappy with what the results I was getting with it. And I've shot a few deer with it now. I think they were, the name was maybe Precision. It was somewhere from out west. I don't know. But they're better than, but still not where we want. You were using those 300 grainers there. Oh, yeah, that's right. I had Nosler muzzle loader bullets, 300 grain, and no, oh, they just punish you to shoot. I had to Knock drop. Knock your fillings out. <laughs> yeah. I got a buddy that's Kind of doing some. He was on. He was on the podcast Jamie Savage. He was on once, and then he's got that double team in video on the on the channel. Him and uh, him and his buddy Kyle there killed two bucks at the same time. I don't know if you've seen that video, it's pretty good. Yep. It's on our YouTube. But Jamie's been exploring with the big heavy grain um, muzzleloader stuff, trying to brush cut. And I got to imagine those three hundred grain bullets going a little slower would be more. No, I. If it hits something, it hits something. You get a deflection. deflections. Deflection. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know that happens because mm-hmm. we talked about it in the last one. I missed a buck, and Mark was like, "We're gonna go back, and we're gonna go there." And we literally saw the limb that mm-hmm. it hit, and it literally deflected. I mean, several oh, yeah. inches. Oh, I can't feet. think how many trees I've shot over the years. <laughs> Here's Timmy two trees down there. Yep. I had one, I hit two different trees shooting it. I didn't get that deer at all, but I found two spots where there was big cuff marks out of the side of trees. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. What's this story? I know Mark mentioned to me one time, something about shooting a coyote. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was actually, (laughs) this is something that, thank goodness there were witnesses. Yeah, it's, you never would have. So we were hunting us and, was it Dana was with us, right? Dana, yeah. And, uh. We it was fairly early in the season. It was definitely rifle season. It yeah. wasn't muzzleloader, but it was. I, had, I tagged out. I was carrying my shotgun bird hunting. That's right. You were. Yeah. And uh, we were hunting this piece of woods. I had logged up in there 
probably three, four years before that. There was still some decent open skid roads. It was it was just right. And there's this great big old beaver bog, um, a lot of open water. Um, I mean, when I say a big beaver bog, probably five, six acres. Yeah. And we had come down to the edge. It came, comes down on one side of it, you know, heavy to woods right to the edge of the water. And we're looking out over it, and there's just a skim of ice on it. And on the far side, way out across there, it's all cattails coming out and grass and that. And all of a sudden, we hear this crash, crash, crash racket. And here comes a deer running out from the other woods, out through all that with a coyote chasing it. And it went out onto the ice and broke through the ice into the water. And that coyote went in after it and was right on that deer's back, biting at the back of its neck. And the three of us were just sitting there looking like, holy shit, wow. do you see this? Yeah, Imagine if you had a video camera going. Believe yeah. this is happening. Like wow. Marty Stauffer's Wild America right there. Right. And uh, it's a ways off. And I was just like, well, the hell with it. And I pulled my gun up and shot. I hit the coyote offhand. It was coming up. The deer had gone up, up out of the wall. It was trying to crawl up the bank, and that coyote is on its back, pulling it, just biting at it and thrashing. And I'm just offhand. I just said, well, screw it. I'm going to take a poke at it. And uh, I shot, and boom, coyote goes down. Deer goes back in the water. Deer swam around. The deer ended up getting out. Um, but uh, using the GIS computer, at work, you can pull up some really good air photos and you can see where we were standing because it's one shore and you can see on the air photos, you know, I mean, you can zoom right in and measure. G- it's, my- it's better than Onyx. Oh, yeah. it's. I mean, this is what I use for my forestry mapping. It's, yeah. it's pretty wild what you can do, but you can measure distance. It was 230 yards. Wow. And like I said, thank God there were people no, there because no one would ever believe me. Right. No, I believe you. I mean, it- <laughs> It was one of those wild things that you, what is it, one in a million? You always see Probably. That yeah, it, just being at the right place right. at the right time and seeing that, it was just crazy. I hear stories like that all the time, and it's part of, you know, I always think of it when I go in the woods. I'm like, is today going to be the day that something, you know, like I've heard of people that have been, you know, up on a ridge and hear two bucks fighting, come over, and there's these two giants, you know, locked horns. Yeah. It's happened to some friends of mine. Um you know, I have a lot of friends that have had a lot of experiences, and I've, you know, I mean, I'm sure I've had some if I sat back and listened, but most of them live a pretty boring life when it comes to things like that. It just seems like it's kind of the normal normal stuff for me. But, Tim, I think uh, this has been a really good one. I really appreciate you making the trip over. Yeah, no problem. Um, I enjoyed it. I'd love to have you on again and talk more about the, you know, land improvement stuff that you do, the habitat fee, how we as hunters can get more involved, um, you know, with conservation and, and, and access. Because I think access is one of the bigger uh, talking points for, for our future in hunting. So Absolutely. I want to thank you for coming over, Mark, of course. Thank you, too. No problem. And uh, I think we'll do this again. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. We'll catch you on We the hardly next. even scratch the surface uh, of some of the – the foolish stories yeah. over the years. Well, listen, I, this, this, <laughs> this stuff's mobile. Hour. I can drive over. I, I, I want to get a picture of that cart in the barn and the processing so we can, we can do it again. Yep. Sounds good. Cool. No one can save you. You better run.